Good morning. It's good to be back with you today. and We'll continue our study of Proverbs. We'll be in chapter 16 today. Uh, this section of Proverbs is typically known for each verse standing on its own. I think Mason talked about it a little bit last week. And uh, our lesson last week that he did rearranged them, and, and I think Mason taught them in order like, like I think they should be. Uh, sometimes our lesson writers move things around to prove a point, and I think they do a good job of that. And this lesson, they've uh, moved some of the verses around and got them out of order to uh, prove their point. And I think the lesson really talked about pleasing God, but we're going to look at it like it is. Uh, we'll take verse 16 as it is. And uh, like I said earlier, these verses stand on their own in this section of Proverbs. But in this particular part, chapter 16, uh, there's a central message here in uh, verses 1 through 15 is what we'll look at today. And these particular verses all together talk about the sovereignty of God. Uh, which is a difficult subject for some people. Uh, people are confused sometimes, and, and people do believe different things. There's, a, there's an argument going on between the sovereignty of God and man's free will. And, and in some people's lives, they, they kind of fight against one another. But I think you'll see where, where God doesn't intend that to happen. God intends for man's free will and God's sovereignty to line up with one another. And, uh, pe you know, people have a problem with the sovereignty of God. You know, we like to think we're in charge and, and, and we make decisions and we make choices. And, and I think as we see in this lesson that uh, that's not necessarily the case. Let me... Let me pray for us before we get started in chapter 16. Father, we just love you and praise you. And we just thank you so much for your sovereignty. Uh, thank you for the choice you give us. And Father, we just, uh, as we talk about your will today and, and as we talk about man's choices, help us to understand how it all works together. Lord, I, I thank you for, for what you're doing in our life and and Lord, we just know that you're in control. And Father, we uh, I just ask you to watch over us during these terrible times when we just see evil running rampant. Lord, we just see evil people and evil things happening all around us that seem to go unpunished. And, but we know you're in control. And Father, I thank you for our church. I thank you for our staff. I just pray your blessings on them and I pray your guidance on all of us, Lord. Just help us to do your will. Help us to understand it, to be obedient to your will, Lord. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for us. We ask all this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Proverbs chapter 16 <clears throat> says, uh, in our study notes for this lesson, it says the Bible is clear that God is supremely sovereign and is in control of all things. God is in control. He knows everything before it happens. Nothing surprises him. You know, we talk about that all the time. God is never surprised. He said, but God's sovereignty means more than that. It means that God can do whatever God wants to do. So whatever God wants to happen is what's going to happen. And we need to understand that. And our study notes did go on to say that this makes people uncomfortable when, when, when we give God this credit and, this, and, and acknowledge that he has the power to do exactly what he wants to do. And people are uncomfortable because we think we make choices. We have free will to make choices. But we need to understand and I, and I thought the lesson did a real good job of this, that there's no such thing as absolute free will. Uh, and the Bible gives us two biblical reasons why there is no absolute free will. Uh, <clears throat> it says, we cannot do 
exactly in everything that we want to do. There are limits. It says, it says, your will is constrained by your nature. You can only make choices in accordance with your nature. And it gave a good example. It says, since you are a sinner by nature, you cannot choose not to sin. You may not want to sin, and you can try as hard as you want to not to sin, but it's inevitable that you will sin regardless of how hard you try not to. It's our nature to sin, and you're going to sin. So our one biblical reason is our choices are limited to, to our nature. We can't go against our nature. Second, the Bible does teach that God can and does override human free will when he desires to. Proverbs 21.1 says that a king's heart is like channeled water in the Lord's hands. The Lord directs it wherever he chooses. That's God's word. So, so <clears throat> you got to understand we do have choices to make, but we don't have absolute free will. Our free will has limits. And uh, I think the thing to really understand and kind of the title of this lesson is to understand that God is in control. I know it doesn't look like it sometimes. It looks like he's taking a break, but we have to understand that he's still there and he's still in control and he's working things out. Look at uh, chapter 16. Verses 1 through 3. Look at uh, verse 1 there. Kind of goes with what we've been talking about. It says, verse 1, chapter 16. The plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. It says, you know, our study notes say that, that what that means is we make plans, but it's God who determines how they work out if they succeed or not. So, you know, we make plans every day and some fall through and some are successful and some of our plans just fall flat on their face. And it's God who determines if they succeed or not. Look at verse two there, it goes with it. He said, all the ways of, of a man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirit. You know, a man's ways are, they seem right to a man but God looks at our heart or our motive. You know, what's our motive for making our plans? Um, I think what this lesson is trying to do is to get us to make our plans. God's, God's for planning. And it's not condemning us for making plans. But I think God is trying to get us to understand that if we want our plans to succeed, they need to line up with God's will for us. And, and so... God wants us to make plans, but God is looking at our heart. And we have to ask ourselves when we make these plans, what's the motive behind them? Is it strictly for us? Or is the motive in there that I believe this is God's will for me? So I'm, I'm going to plan it that way. And, and that's what he's looking at. Look at verse 3 there. And this is what we just talked about. Commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. You know, pray for God's will to be done is part of, of good planning. You know, it, it, and I'm talking to myself, but a lot of times we'll sit here and pray for God's will to be done in our life. And I, you know, that's a really good prayer, but is it just a prayer or do we really want God's will to be done in our life? And I think that's what this lesson is talking about. It is a good prayer. It sounds good when you pray it. But how many times do we pray for God's will to be done in our life and then we sit down and make our plans and none of it includes God's will. It's Our motive is all about what's good for us. You know, what's, what's good for me is what I'm after. And, and that's what this lesson is trying to show. Especially in verse 3, commit your work to the Lord. When, when you're planning, plan it around God's will for your life and your plans will be established. That's what God's word promises to us here. And, uh, you know, we need to remember when we plan something and we plan it around God's will and it, 
comes true. It happens. Who do we give the credit to? You know, I, I always say, or I try to, it's not me that's doing this, but it's God working through me. Well, if I truly believe that God is working through me, then why would I not make my plans centered on God's will for my life? And then why in the world, when it comes to fruition, when it happens, would I pat myself on the back and say, look what I did? I have to say, look what God did through me. And, and that's how God's sovereignty works. You see, God, we got to understand God is in control in these first three verses. Sometimes we think we are, and we, and we think we're good planners, but no, God is still in control. Verses uh, four and five take a little change here, and it's talking about, th this entire chapter is talking about God's sovereignty, but this talks about God's sovereignty to judge evil. You know, it says God will sovereignly judge evil. And uh, this is a good part in this chapter because I know it's talking about what's on everybody's mind, you know. Uh, because and, and we'll talk about it a little bit. Sometimes it's, it's like evil's not, not being punished. <laughs> People are getting away with with just murder. And uh, but no, God's still there. God's in control, and God will judge evil because that's part of His sovereignty. It says in verse 4, the Lord has made everything for its purpose. Everything that God has made has a purpose. Even the wicked for the day of trouble. God has made the wicked for a day of trouble. And, and we need to remember that God sees everything. Nothing escapes God. There are no secrets to God. There are no surprises. But there's also no secrets from God. We may be able to hide sin from one another, but we can't hide it from God. And God does judge sin. He says, the Lord has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked for the day of trouble. Look at verse five. Everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination to the Lord. And this is, this is something we need to remember here. And remember, God's looking at the heart. He, he sees your motives. He sees why you're doing what you're doing, why you're planning the way you're planning. But he says, be assured he will not go unpunished. God sees everything. And God says that even the wicked were created for a time. Even, even the wicked will come into play under God's sovereignty. God's in control of everything. God determines whether a man's path works, which way a man goes, whether if he succeeds or fail. And, and even though we see the wicked, sometimes it looks like they're going unpunished, there will come a day when God's sovereignty is poured out on him and God's wrath against ungodliness. <clears throat> and it says, be assured, they will go punished. And uh, verses six through nine, talk about God sovereignly saves and rewards sinners who submit to him. It's still God's sovereignty, but it's, a, it's what God is doing in, in our lives. Look at verse 6. He said, by steadfast love and faithfulness, iniquity is atoned for. And by the fear of the Lord, one turns away from evil. He said, God... In these, our study notes say God must pour out his wrath on sin, but he also makes atonement for sin. All evil breaks his heart and must be judged, but he graciously judges human sin at the cross so we can escape hell. That's what a wonderful God we have who is sovereign and who must judge sin. Remember, our sin had a price, and that price was paid at the cross. It, it didn't go unpaid. It's not like it was just forgiven. It was forgiven to us, but the debt was paid, 
And God judged our sin at the cross. And, and so he, he has to judge sin, but his sovereignty requires that. He wouldn't be a sovereign God if he didn't judge sin and punish sin. But he loves us so much that he judged our sin and our punishment at the cross. And verse 7 says, <clears throat> I would look at verse 6. He said, by steadfast love and, and faithless iniquity is atoned for and by the fear of the Lord. <clears throat> One turns away from evil. And then verse 7, when a man's way pleases the Lord, <clears throat> he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. This is interesting because the first time I read this, and probably the first time you'll read this in this lesson, you're trying to think right now, well, who are your enemies? Well, <clears throat> in the New Testament, our enemies are not individuals. Uh, our enemies are sin, Satan, and death. And it says that uh, when a man's ways pleases the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at his peace. Then you go back to six with, with the, his atonement for our sins. We have to remember that, that because God judged our sin and our punishment at the cross, then we have victory over our enemies. And, and the enemies he's talking about here is Satan. We have victory over Satan. Death. We have victory over death. <clears throat> and uh, we have victory over sin. Yeah, we're still sinners. We still sin. But we have victory over it because God, in his sovereignty, judges our sin at the cross. The sin that we did, the sin that we're doing now, and any sin that we will do is judged at the cross. That's the kind of God that we serve. And that's the kind of God it says that man pleases him. We, we please God when we come to God and we ask for his mercy. And then <clears throat> look at verse 8. And verse 8 is a little different. Our first nine verses all mention the Lord. But verse 8 doesn't mention the Lord. And it, it, this is a qualifying verse according to our, our study notes here. And, and uh, what it's trying to show us is that in this particular verse, it looks like the Lord is missing. And as we look around in the world today, people may say, it, it, where did God go? It looks like the Lord is missing. And, and so this verse tells us what's actually going on. And, and, and if you ever say to yourself, you know, what, what's happening right now? Where is God? Well, God's here. God's in control. And, uh, but he says, better is a little righteousness than great revenues with injustice. You know, uh, sometimes the world seems a little bit upside down. Proverbs teaches us that righteous people get ahead. Righteous people are rewarded. And uh, the rich and the wicked become poor typically according to the Bible and, and, and especially in Proverbs but it seems like the rich and the wicked are getting ahead and they're being rewarded and, and their people are blatantly doing things that don't line up with God's word and people are successful in their own ways and people are, are making poor decisions but good things come out of it and, and Righteous people are suffering because of their righteousness. And wicked are becoming rich because of their wicked. And it seems like it's an upside down world. And, and a lot of us wonder, you know, when are they going to get their punishment? I mean, wh what's happened to God? Where is God at? Does he not see this? And, and this verse is in there to show us that God hadn't gone anywhere. He's still there. And, and we need to understand that uh, there will be times 
when the wicked become enriched because of their wickedness and the righteous will be poor because of their righteousness. We're, we're, there's a time when you're going to be punished for who you are, a Christian. And in those times we'll be tempted to think God is absent, not involved, but he is still there working things out for his good purposes. It will be worked out. Evil can succeed temporarily and the righteous can suffer. But in the end, God turns the tables. You know, we use the phrase all the time, we win in the end. And we need to keep telling ourselves that, especially today you know, and what things look like. I, I know <clears throat> it's an election year, and those are usually pretty rough anyway. But I've never seen one this way. I've never seen a nation that disrespected its president the way people do with this president. Uh, I, I've never seen... You know, we have two parties, basically. We have Democrats and Republicans, and they're always at each other. I expect that. But there's people in each party that hate the president. And, uh, you know, our president deserves respect because of who he is. And we know as Christians that he is president because God allowed him to be president. God puts presidents there. <clears throat> and... Uh, and then all the riots and everything that's going on in our world today. And, and it just, sometimes it just appears that evil is winning. And evil may be winning right now. These verses tell us that there are times when, when evil people are successful in getting what they want. But we just need to remember that God is in control. God's working all things out for God's good purposes. And in the end, we win. At the end, the roles will be reversed, and it will go back to like Proverbs is preaching. The righteous will be successful, and evil will be punished. <clears throat> and then, let's see, we were at eight. And then it says, the heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. This is a repeat of verse one, basically. Remi the Solomon is reminding you here of, of what he started off with that you're not in control. God is. You, you may make a plan, but it's God who ordains your steps. And it's God who, who is in charge. <clears throat> and uh, what Solomon is doing here is he's talking to his sons. And uh, Solomon is teaching his sons how to be a king for God, how, how to be the king that they're supposed to be when, when they grow up to be the king, and uh, how to be a, a king that is led by God and, and the responsibilities of a king. He gets into it in, in verse 10, and, and uh, only problem with Solomon and his sons is that none of them ever turned out to be the king they were supposed to be. Not even Solomon. He couldn't do it. And uh, now, these, these verses <clears throat> 10 through 15 talk about a king. And, and it's funny that we would have this lesson while we're preparing for a presidential election. You know, there's, there's coming a day when, when we won't have a president anymore. We'll be ruled by a king. That king will have absolute rule. And uh, none of the kings in Solomon's family here ever turned out to be that, that king. Uh, 10 through 15 talk about God sovereignly rules the world through the Messiah. So God is sending a Messiah to not only save us, but he's going to be our ruler. He's going to be our king. And... Uh, The word king is prominent in the next few verses and uh, one to, uh, just like one through nine had the Lord in it, uh, king is in all the next verses but verse 11. And it shows that the first section of this chapter is it, talked about the, the sovereignty of God and the second section of it mirrors the first section but it's talking about a king that's coming. And it shows you that our future king, 
that God is going to rule through lines up with God's sovereignty. It says God sovereignly rules the world through his king, through the Messiah. And uh, in the Old Testament, it says God's sovereignty is mediated to the people through a human king. And now Proverbs is talking about a messianic king. And it gives us some descriptions of what this king is going to be like, beginning in verse 10. He said, look at verse 10. It says, an oracle is on the lips of a king. His mouth does not send in judgment. A just balance and scales are the Lord's. All the weights in his bag are his work. It is an abomination to kings to do evil, for the throne is established by righteousness. Righteous lips are the delight of a king, and he loves who speaks what is right. A king's wrath is a messenger of death, and a wise man will appease it. In the light of the king's face, there is life. And his favor is like the clouds that bring the spring rain. All of this, talking about this messianic king, lines up with what we've talked about in God's sovereignty. They're, they're, they're going to mesh together, just like our free will and the sovereignty of God is not meant <clears throat> to oppose one another. They're meant to work together. And, and this will happen the same way. He says... <clears throat> In verse 10, it says that God's verdict is on the king's lip. When the king judges, he judges rightly. He does not do anything that is unjust. He literally speaks for God. And uh, this is ultimately fulfilled in, uh, in Jesus Christ. And it's in Acts chapter 2, verses 25 through 36. Jesus fulfills what Proverbs here is, is talking about. The Messianic King is none other than Jesus Christ. It says the Messianic King will make sure there is equity in his kingdom. Uh, and it talks, of the, it talks about the church as being an outpost of the kingdom. We should be a model of fairness, equity, and righteousness to the world because we are a picture of what Jesus is going to be like when he comes and sets his kingdom up. Uh, 11 and 12 there. Uh, just show how this king's rule is fair and, and equitable. It's the same for all people. Uh, a just balance of scales, you know. Uh, <clears throat> man has two sets of scales. And one's used for buying, one's used for selling. God will use the same set of scales for everyone, for all purchases. Uh, it says uh, an, an oracle is on the lips of a king. The king, our king, that we're looking forward to, Jesus Christ, will speak for God because he is God. And the things that, that come out of God's mouth will come out of our king's mouth. And uh, he says the things that come out of this king's mouth does not send in judgment. Judgment is fair. The scales are fair. And, and look at 12. It is an abomination to, for kings to do evil, for the throne is established by righteousness. Uh, only a righteous king that does God's work and is truly honest can, can be this messianic king because his kingdom will not last. And God's word tells us that Jesus Christ's kingdom will last for eternity. And uh, so Jesus is the one they're talking about here. And, and, and this is why Solomon's sons didn't work out. They, they could not maintain their, their throne because of the, the evilness in their heart and what they were doing. He, he says, <clears throat> righteous, in verse 13, righteous lips are the delight of a king, and he loves him who speaks what is right. <clears throat> It, it shows us in these, these verses that wicked behavior should be detestable to any king. 
And as I was reading that, I think about today, we have a president and we have uh, uh, people running for that office. We have uh, two particular people that we're allowed to vote for. And, and, and all of our politicians that, that make our rules and enforce our rules. Uh, and, and then you read, wicked behavior is detestable to any king. Uh, those who practice wickedness, just like merchants with unfair weights, are repulsive to God, and a king's throne will only last if he reigns in righteousness and justice. And that's Jesus Christ only. Uh, we don't have anybody now even close to this. And uh, just remember that God is in control here, and that one day we will be led by a king, we will be ruled by a king, and his, his <clears throat> throne is set up in righteousness and he will be fair with everybody. Uh, righteous lips are the delight of a king and he loves who speaks what is right. A king's wrath is a messenger of death. If you, if you read that, you see that, that our king is in charge of life and death. He's in charge of, of love and punishment and it's, and it's dealt fairly. And uh, uh, if you, if you, in the light of a king's face, there is life. But he's also, his wrath is a messenger of death. The, the king will uphold God's love and God's wrath on sin. Uh, <clears throat> he says, uh, one of our notes said, only Jesus can come and set up a kingdom where there is no wickedness or injustice. He establishes his eternal kingdom in righteousness by judging the wicked. Judgment is a part of God's sovereignty and it has to happen. But remember, God is willing to judge us and our sins at the cross if we make that choice. And he desires for our choices to line up with his will. He says, <clears throat> Thus the king fulfilled in the, in the promise Jesus is to be judge and punisher. Life and death are in his hands, just like they're in God's hands. The king wills life and death on God's behalf. <clears throat> and uh, so you can see in chapter 16 how God's a sovereign God and what God wants to happen will happen, that God is in control. But you see the way we're headed, the promises that are coming, when Jesus comes back, that he will set up his kingdom here on earth and God's sovereignty will be carried out through Jesus Christ. Our king will be a sovereign king who will carry out God's will and, and we will be treated fairly and, and he will be in charge. And uh, <clears throat> there was a part in our notes that talked about the conclusion, he says, our response to the sovereign Lord should be one way, and that's to bow the knee. And uh, we bow to the King, Jesus, because God's sovereign plan for the world is centered on the Messiah. God's sovereign plan is to exalt the Son and through him to render, through him to redeem persons from every people group on earth. God's plan will not be stopped. I know we like to think we're in control, but we're not in control. We make plans based on God's will for our life, and then it's up to God to make them come through or not. We pray that God would use us as a vessel to carry out his will in our lives, and we owe God the credit for when things do happen to work out and, and we have success in what we're trying to do. We owe it all to God, <clears throat> and we need to understand, even though right now things look rough, we're dealing with the virus, <clears throat> and I don't have it, I just have a sore throat or cold or sinuses or something, but we're dealing with this virus, we're dealing with, uh, if you've been outside, we've been dealing with the heat, we're dealing with an election year, <clears throat> we're dealing with rebellion throughout our nation, 
We're dealing with people who want to burn it down. We're dealing with people who, who want to just do away with things that we stand for. We, we're dealing with people who want to defund police departments. And we know that, that uh, police and, and leaders and, and presidents and, and the, the people we have in control, the laws that we have, uh, are from God. And, and, and the worst police department in the world would be better than none. Uh, it's just common sense. But, but as we deal with all this, there's sometimes a tendency for people to just give up and to just throw in the towel. And, you know, I'm sure I've said it and you may have said it, you know, where is God in all this and what, what's he doing? Well, he's working, he's working and he has a plan. And we need to understand that God is never surprised. Nothing is hidden from God. There are no secrets from God. And God has a plan based on all that. And it's in God's timing. I, we do know that from, from our studies. And that one day, we're, we're not going to have all this. When Jesus comes back, he's got to set up his kingdom. And Jesus <clears throat> will reign in his kingdom. And God's sovereign will will apply to Jesus Christ. Everything that God is, Jesus is. And Jesus will rule that way. He will be in charge. And uh, he, will, he will be in charge of death and life. And, and he will make sure that we're all treated fairly and equitably. Uh, all we have to do is bow the knee. Surrender our life to Jesus Christ. It's available to us. God will judge our sins at the cross. And uh, if you're already following Jesus, you know, great. Don't give up. Hang in there. Uh, this, this proverb shows us what God's sovereignty is like. And, and God's sovereignty is not anything to be afraid of. Yes, God is in charge. But... <clears throat> Who would you rather have in charge? Somebody who's never surprised, somebody who knows what's going to happen tomorrow, or us that uh, we're surprised often and I don't have a clue what's going to happen tomorrow. It's just better for us, to, for God to be in, in charge. And uh, I hope you enjoy chapter 16 as you, as you study it. And uh, just remember when you get down, God's in control. He hadn't gone anywhere, and uh, he's still there. And God has a plan. So uh, I appreciate you listening to me. I, I hope you enjoy this. And let me pray for us. Father, we just love you and praise you. And I, I just thank you for, for this lesson. I, I thank you for just reassuring us that uh, you're there and, and that you're in control. And uh, Father, I just thank you so much for your promises. I know that one day that when Jesus comes back, it won't be anything like what we have today. That, that it will be wonderful that uh, Jesus God in the flesh will be our king and he will rule in your righteousness and Lord I just pray for that day and I pray that many people would understand this proverb and understand why it's important for us for your sovereign will to be done and Lord, I just thank you for our church, for our pastor and our staff. I ask you to be with each and every one of them. I ask you to guide and direct them. I pray for your will to be done in their life too. And Lord, I just pray for your blessings on this church as we, as we try to reopen, as we try to come back together. Just watch over us and protect us from the evil out there, including this virus. And help us as we go forward, Lord. We just ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.